Okay, so we're going to take a look at what happens when you have two secants. Now, remember, um, a tangent is a, is a line that hits in one spot, comes across a circle and hits in one spot. A chord is a segment that, that is on the circle, inside the circle that goes from the circle to the circle. Last is a secant, which is a really a line that comes all the way through the circle. Doesn't hit in one spot. It keeps on coming through. So it hits it in two spots, which means a chord is a piece of a secant. So I probably should have had this thing open as I said that. But keep in mind, if I were to extend this line going along this way, that is a secant. We're only going to look at a portion of the secant, but this is a secant line because you notice it's going to cross the circle in two places and continue. So what we want to find out is what happens when you have a situation where you have these two chords um, that are part of secants and, and how that actually works. So very similar to the other video, and if you didn't watch it, it's fine. I will try to lay this out like you don't need it. Um, but there, I wanted to develop where this little formula comes from. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and draw in a little dotted line here and here. Because, again, what we like to do sometimes in math is bring our concepts back to something we're a little bit more familiar with. Now, this could be a little bit confusing as we lay this out, but I want to be super, super clear about something. And one of those things that I wanted to be clear about is that when you look at this angle right here, it actually um, intercepts this arc right here. So I know that this angle right here is exactly half the measure of this arc, but the same could be stated of this angle right here, that that angle is also half of that same arc. And therefore, those two angles must, in fact, be the same as each other. Now, if we keep going and you consider this triangle right here, that goes to this top secant, and you consider this bottom triangle right here that goes to this bottom secant, you're going to notice that both of those triangles involve this angle right here. So interestingly enough, what I could again say is that these two triangles are congruent by angle, angle. But what is a little bit different about this in the previous one is you'll notice that the segment between the single and the double angle on this bottom one is on is below, and this one is, of course, on top because of how it works. So I'm going to call this A, uh, B, C, D, and E. And I would then be able to say that triangle A, B, D is similar to triangle C, B, E. Again, just like the other one by double A. Now, when we do that, that pro provides us a little bit of an easy thing to do. So I'm going to go ahead and start making some, some letters in here to hopefully make this make sense. So kind of like on the previous one, I'm going to call this little piece M, this little piece N, this little piece right here X, and this little piece right here Y. Now, specifically what I wanted to look at is how do these things relate to each other? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a little relationship between, because remember, when triangles are similar, they are proportional. So we can set up a ratio between the sides. So for example, if I wanted to look at the side, um, let's see, uh, AB, which is part of this top triangle, and I said, hey, let's take a look at the ratio of A to B. Now, A to B in one of the triangles would be the same as uh, C to B in the other triangle. And that should be the same as the ratio, uh, again, of, let's say, um, D to B in the top triangle and uh, E to B in the bottom triangle, because no, this is the bottom triangle, but E to B would be that spot. So DB and EB are the same place. So if we were looking at it, we could sort of cross multiply really quickly and say that the product of A and B times E and B is the same as CB times DB. Now that's how the textbook calls it. I just have always had a hard time just using the letters to do that. 
I find it a little bit easier to think about them, you know, just as a single variable segment. And so what I see is the distance from A to B is all the way right here, which is M plus N. And EB, as it turns out, is just N. So that's a little bit interesting. Notice that N plays a role twice because it was the distance from A to B multiplied by the distance from E to B is the same thing as C to B, which is X plus Y, times the part on the outside, times DB, which is Y. So see the, the, re the repetition of these two outer portions. So the way I have found it easiest to me for this particular thing is I always said the whole thing, which is M plus N, times the outside is equal to the whole thing, X plus Y, times the outside. That's the way that I found it to be the easiest to understand, okay? So that's the long part of the explanation. So here comes the quicker part of the explanation. So if we were to look at this bottom portion and consider what the whole thing is, well, the whole thing right here would be a length of 12 multiplied by the portion that's on the outside, which is eight. So this is whole times outside is equal to the whole thing, which is X plus six times the outside, which of course is six. That's kind of nice. Now, depending on how you like to look at it, most people are going to go ahead and use the distributive property, although you certainly would not have to. I'll, divide, I'll subtract 36 from both sides. And I got this, and so I got X equals 10. Now, let's just double check. According to this, the whole thing, just grab the calculator so I don't have to do this all in my head, the whole thing, which is 12, times the outside piece, 8, is equal to the whole thing, which is 16, times the outside piece, which is 6. And so 96 and, whoops, 96, I hit my camera. So we're good. Now over here, this is going to look a little bit different because this is really a secant and a tangent. And there is technically a totally different proof, but it turns out it's the whole, it's the same exact relationship. So when we look at this thing and we say the whole thing, 16, times the outside, whole times out, which is nine, is equal to the whole thing, which is X, times the outside, which is actually also X, because the whole thing is outside, right? It's a tangent, so it never enters the circle. So there's never that inside portion. So I end up with 144 equals X squared. You can kind of tell I probably rigged that problem. And I got that the whole thing, 16 times nine is X times X, 144, that makes X 12. And you can see the whole thing is 144 right here. You got it. See, 16 times 9 is 144, and 12 times 12 is also 144. We're good. So sometimes they're pretty easy. This one right here I wanted to highlight is actually the hardest pro problem, and in fact, the one that is the toughest to get. And so I, I will slow down on this one a little bit. So again, if I start with the whole thing, which is x plus 4, the worst thing is when somebody leaves that outer portion right here alone is equal to the whole thing, which is 18, times the outside piece, which is, again, 8. Now, what that leaves me with is x squared plus 4x equals, let's see, um, 18 times 8. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but I got 144. Uh, it just so happens to be the same numbers I had up here. I was just trying to come up with a number that I thought would be fairly kind. But this is a little bit different. This particular problem, if you tried to factor it like we've done in the previous video, which I guess I'll do over here, um, plus 4x minus 144 is 0. If you try to factor it, come up with two numbers whose product is negative 144, whose sum is 4, the answer is no, you can't do it. It's, it, it doesn't factor. But we talked last unit in our quadratic unit about another option, which we use very, very recently when we dealt with circles. 
where you cut this in half and got two and you squared it and you got four, but we added that four to both sides. And the result of that is you have this perfect x plus two squared is 148. And so if we take the square root of both sides, we are pretty much good to go. Now, we should probably fix that 148 a little bit by saying that I know that 2 goes into 148 um, 74 times and 2 goes into 74 37 times. So I could say that that's 2 roots of 37. But I need to move this 2 across. And that's what, what completing the square leaves us with is negative two plus four minus two roots of 37. But what's really kind of important is if you look at this, if you started with negative two and you subtracted two roots of 37, in fact, I'm gonna grab a, a, a calculator here real quick that I think it will, will be easier to see. But see, if I started with negative two and I, subtract two roots of 37, I get a really large negative number, which is not possible to indicate this length right here because that length has to be a positive. So in fact, when we look at this answer, we could kind of cross this one off and just say it's the top one, it's only the plus because it's actually okay to take negative two and add two roots of 37. So really quickly, I'm going to store that as A, so I have that on my calculator. But what I want to see is the whole thing, which is A plus 4, that 10.16 times plus 4, times A, the outside portion, is, what is that? Well, I got 144, which, what do you know, is exactly the number we said we were supposed to get. So hopefully that's helpful. Now, I, I didn't want to make the video super, super long. But see, when you're over here, there's another option we could have done as well. We could have done the quadratic formula. We could also do opposite B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Um, and that's not a bad way to go where A is, sorry, my papers fell. A would be 1, B would be 4, and C would be negative 144. And that will work. I just find that completing the square is actually a little bit easier because it does the same stuff, just in bite-sized pieces. Okay, hopefully that was helpful, and I will see you guys back in class later. Bye-bye.